Thank you all very much. It's a pleasure for me to be here tonight. Again, I'm Dr. Hal Urshaw, an addiction psychiatrist, known as psychologist, psychiatrist, I'm an MD, and um, I uh, work with a company called EnterHealth, and we're an addiction treatment company here in Dallas-Fort Worth. We actually cover most of Texas and Oklahoma in terms of our, our um, uh, coverage area. We see uh, people with all kinds of alcohol and drug problems. We have an outpatient program in the Park Cities, and we have a residential program up near McKinney, uh, just north from 75, so not too bad, maybe 45 minutes from here. Take 121 when you're not at rush hour. And so my goal today is to just be out here and to try and educate. My, I don't want anybody here or any of your kids or any of your family ever to come to Inner Health. Best way to treat it is to not start addiction, right? And so there's so much misinformation out there that EnterHealth, we believe it's, it's important to educate our community in which we live. We started EnterHealth because we wanted Dallas-Fort Worth to have a great addiction treatment program here locally. You don't have to go away. If you need it, you got help. If you want to get assessed, you know, we do a lot of assessments, et cetera. So, but we don't want you to ever, ever have to come see it. If you, if you needed somebody, we're very good to help you. But we have, a, we have a residential facility, we have an outpatient facility, we also do a lot of telehealth. Some people never even come in our office. Um, so we have a, we kind of take advantage of technology. But why am I here tonight? I'm here just because, not only to talk about, look, sorry, get a little carried away here. We're not, we're not only to talk about marijuana and baking, but just to talk about all of addiction. Alcohol, which is the big 800 pound gorilla out there, okay? Um, there's a lot of misinformation about that. And in order for the field of addiction treatment to evolve, we got to stay up with the science. That's why we founded our, our treatment program. A lot of treatment programs focus on not the science, but just other things. And their success rates aren't nearly as high as if you use the science, just like in any other addiction, any other medical problem in, in our <coughs> body. You know, cardiology, you want the latest science. Cancer, you want the latest science. Addiction, you want the latest science. And there's so much misinformation about this particular area that we find that if we just educate the parents, that that's going to be very, very helpful because you're suckered in to the messages that our teens and our kids are, are getting. Just because we all watch social media, the government gets suckered in to all this. I mean, nobody's overseen right now the e-cigarette e companies. I mean, they're starting to, but they've been unregulated for about six years. It's just, it, they've been getting away with literally murder. Um, and so, in order to be thought leaders, we want to keep the cutting edge in our communities to keep our communities as safe as possible. So this, I want to talk about addiction in the spectrum of use. Okay, so for the next couple slides, I'm not going to be talking about addiction. Okay, I'm not going to be talking about vaping, I'm not going to be specifically, or marijuana, but just any substance use, okay, including nicotine. But, you know, there's a lot of people out there that don't use. So this is everybody in the country or everybody in the world, let's just use the country. A lot of people don't use. Most people use substances just socially or recreationally, and most people in the country just use alcohol. All right, now marijuana is starting to come online, um, just due to a lot of myths and misinformation, which hopefully I'll dispel tonight. At some point, you might start using a little bit more regularly, so it's sort of moderate use, not every night, not every day, uh, maybe every weekend or whatever. And then at some point, if you keep using, you, you increase your tolerance and you end up using daily. Even if you're using daily, most of the time you're not addicted. Thank God. Only about 10% of the people that get addicted, only 10% of the people that do use, excluding nicotine, okay? But most 10% of people that do use an addictive substance outside of nicotine get addicted. And what happens is you've used it enough that all these substances are neurotoxic. They injure, not damage. In damage, you really can't really repair too well. Injury means you hurt it, it's like I break my leg, it heals, I can use my leg again. Damage is if, I, in my, instead of breaking my arm, if I put my arm through a tree shredder, you know, if I put off the branch, took it off, up past the elbow, well, if, if I were to live and it healed, I'd, my arm would just have a stump, that's, that's damaged. The brain in addiction is about injury, meaning it can heal if you just stop poisoning it. But if you use substances enough, you injure enough that all of a sudden a switch flips, a, a figurative switch. And once the switch turns on, the part of your brain that runs the operating system of the brain takes over. And even though you want to stop, you can't without treatment. Okay? And, that's, and so you go from, some, from chronic use, daily use, to something happens, you now become chained to the substance. You can't walk away from it. 
All right, and then once once you're now chained to the substance, now you move this all the way back down to that end, and now you have a whole spectrum of the substance use, sort of early alcoholism, moderate alcoholism, severe alcoholism, late stage, I mean, you know, chaotic alcoholism. And so out here is where most people think of addiction. You know, the alcoholic with no resources, lost their, 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 their loved one, their family, their health, living under a bridge in a cardboard box, okay? Most of the alcoholics we treat in, in out, inner health look just like everyone here. In fact, you couldn't, once you get sober, you couldn't take it sit right there, you, you would not know. But the problem is that this person, when you get to this stage, most people know you have a problem. Sometimes this person doesn't. Usually the person with addiction is the last person, they're the last person in their, in their group to know. Everybody else knows, and they've been known it for a long time. But they didn't know what to do. So we're going to talk about that a little bit later when we get to actual addiction. Oh, before I jump to this slide. All along this spectrum, if you're a teenager, you may not get addicted, but it's, these are neurotoxins you're hurting your brain. And in the adolescent brain, it's still under construction. So it's extra vulnerable. Extra vulnerable to injury, and it's also easier to get addicted when you're an adolescent than when you're an adult. That, that sounds weird, but I'll show you why here in a second. So what does the brain do? As it's growing, okay, nine years old or so, your circuitry is fine-tuning. Ten to fifteen adolescents, you're better equipping to plan, retain, and your brain's growing, I'll show you in a second. And then this is when you get more abstract. Right, so if you start using some time in here, okay, um, you're going you're gonna to be more vulnerable to, to diving off the normal development. You're going to take a detour off normal development. You're going to injure your brain, and you have a higher chance of getting addicted and staying addicted the rest of your life. So this, this is an artist rendition of a brain going from age 5 to 20. If you look at it, you notice it turns more blue. All right, why is it turning blue? Well, it's not really turning blue, okay? But in the artist rendition, what's happening as it matures, the different brain cells that are communicating, you have billions of these, as they talk to each other, they wrap these connections with a, with a really high, high, highly connective substance called myelin. And as you, as you lay down myelin, your brain cells start talking to each other much faster. It's kind of like, before myelin, you kind of have a dirt road. After myelin's on, it's kind of like you have a Toltec express lane. Okay, it's a big difference in speed and efficiency, et cetera. And so, but it, while, it's, while myelin's laying down, if you hurt it, you really can cause some problems that take a lot longer to injure, a lot longer to repair the road than if you wait and hurt it once the road's already set up. Once it's already set up, you get a pothole. If you injure while it's being built, you got major fractures in the foundation of the road or the bridge. That's a problem. It takes a lot, it's more expensive and longer to fix that problem. And so the brain talks in electricity between different neurons, and it also uses chemicals, neurotransmitters. What are some? Serotonin, dopamine, enkephalins, endorphins, those are all neurotransmitters. Those are just chemicals the brain uses to, to communicate. And the, the chemicals set off electrical charges, and that's how the brain communicates. It's very, very complex. If I hold this remote out here, okay, I'm not falling over, I'm not drooling, okay, I'm not dropping my arm. All right, I'm not crushing the remote. There's a lot of brain cells just working very hard. It's a very complex, very powerful, complex system, but it's also very fragile and susceptible to injury. Take, for example, this is a normal brain. This is a type of, of imaging called a SPECT, S-P-E-C-T. It's pioneered by this doctor, Dr. Amen. I can amen at the end of a prayer. Okay, you can Google him and, and spec, and you can get a lot of these pictures that are on the internet. Really good, very helpful. This is a normal brain. But it, looks, it measures oxygen. It measures how the brain works. It measures oxygen and sugar, or glucose, the, two, the brain's two main fuels. Normal brain, marijuana-addicted brain. Okay. Normal brain, these are three different views of a person who's an alcoholic. Looking from the bottom, from the front, from the side. That's not a normal brain. You don't have to be a doctor and go to all these four years of medical school to say, hey, this brain's really hurt on the inside. On the outside, it looks just like you and me. But this is why when somebody gets addicted, they've hurt their brain enough that once you get detox, you go through, you just get the substance out of your body. Now you're going to have to wait about a year, year and a half of 
no substance, meaning no poison, you have to just keep the poison out, and this brain can go back to that. Thankfully, that's huge. Okay, the sooner you stop, the quicker, the quicker you you revert. So if you drink, you know, we have people come into Inner Health, uh, maybe at 55, right? They say, "Gosh, I've been drinking for 30 years, Doctor Urshel. It's terrible." I say, "You look good, but you didn't come in at 65." All right? Wish they come in at 45. Really wish they come in at 30. All right, 15, yes, 15 less years of neurotoxins. All right, so what kind of potential might they have lost? They may never get back. Even if they get to normal, they may not be where they would have been if they hadn't. And that's what I really worry about for teens. Most of your teens won't get addicted, but if they're using substances now, which everybody's trying to get them, okay? This is, I was talking, to, there was a bunch of teachers, great teachers, they took, took time out of a busy schedule to come in and sat for, a, for a, a talk for about an hour, about a couple hours ago. And, you know, it's, it's them and you, the parents, are on one side, in the middle of, a, of a sort of this fight, like a, like a fighting ring, is your child and their brain. On the other side, the alcohol companies, the cigarette companies, the vaping companies, the marijuana companies now, the, the, the financial marijuana companies, and the drug cartels. And it's a fight, you versus them, the teachers and you versus them for your child's brain. Okay? What is the other side? Why does the other side want your child's brain? Money. Total, total financial transaction. The whole Adam Smith capitalism, they want the money. Why do you want your child's brain? You will love them, you care about them, you want them to have a, a great quality of life. Right? So it's a push-pull. The more you know, the more and they're gonna they're gonna use now the powerful the powerful channels of social media to put out myth truths, myths out there to get you all, the government, and your kids to say, hey, this is pretty safe, it's not too bad. And so my goal tonight is not to tell you what to do, how to parent, not to tell your kids, no, you shouldn't use these. Say, look. Here's the data. Let's make some decisions based on real data. You're not. You're getting, as I said, with teachers. This is, you get a lot of fake news. There's a lot of fake news in this space right now, right? So the goal tonight is to change that. By the way, opiate addiction, opiate crisis right now. Normal brain, opiate addiction brain. Again, it can go back about a year, year and a half of sobriety. You can get it back to normal. So when you do get addicted, all right, it's not that you're not trying. It's that you're actually injured your brain. And even if you don't get addicted, when teens use alcohol and drugs, it's not good. But the bottom, this is the hope. If you do get addicted and you get the right treatment, the science-based treatment, you have about 85% chance of getting better, of, of a total sobriety. Why I say that is most people don't think once you're addicted there's any hope. Doctors don't think. Doctors think, hey, if I have an alcoholic patient, there's nothing they can do. I'm not even going to talk about it. I'm just going to, hopefully they'll go to AA. AA is about a 20% success rate. Okay, they don't know that doctors have been educated. So you need to get educated yourself. If you or a loved one knows there's a problem, what do you do? We can give you some resources tonight to know what to do. Finally, before I launch into marijuana, let me just talk about this other piece. When your brain's hurt, okay, the chemicals and the electricity get out of balance. Even before you use substances, a lot of times your brain chemical history is out of balance. And when your chemicals are out of balance, if they're too low, you get depressed. If some are high, some low, you get anxious. If it's too high, you get manic, right? You can also get some of these other things, ADHD, PTSD. This is all brain chemistry imbalances, and why is it important? Well, at inner health, 95% of the patients that come to us, they all have addiction, but addiction is mostly, is usually not the problem. It's usually one of these these psychiatric illnesses that's causing it, and they've used the substance to self-medicate. So when you get addiction, when you treat it, you have to treat the psychiatric illness with non addictive Like, if you have anxiety, or you're drinking alcohol, and you come and you get detoxed, if I give you Xanax for your anxiety, you're gonna get addicted to that. A lot of psychiatrists would do that. So you, as, you just need to you understand that these need to be addressed simultaneously in an, in an intelligent way. And then you get a lot better outcomes. By the way, I'm happy to take questions as we go. If I'm going to talk about an answer, I'll say, hey, wait, let me, let me a couple more slides, and if I don't answer your question. So 
feel free to feel free to chime in if you have questions as we go. Let's jump into let's jump into marijuana. And look, I'm talking to adults. Um, uh, if when I talk when I talk to kids, uh, like if I talk to your kids, I said marijuana. They kind of know what it is, but they don't call it marijuana. What do they call it? Weed. They don't even call it pot anymore. Pot's old. It's weed. Just so you know, all right? And other things, but. I, they taught me that. They said, well, Dr. Mitchell, why do you say pot all the time? Why do you say weed? So, what does using weed cost you? Right? This is, so this is some of the information that you might be able to have discussions about with your, with your child. So, um, what I like to talk about is, you know, I can't tell your child what to do. So you can try, right? But it's better if they kind of feel it's their idea. Right? You have more buy-in. And so... We, I asked them, you know, what do you want in life? I like to talk to kids. I'll talk to sometimes just the kids themselves. You know, what do you want in life? So, you know, most of them say, well, I want to, I want to make a lot of money. Okay, so we all know money's good. You know, that may not be the, the end goal, but from a teenager, let's just use that. Okay, how much you want to make? A million dollars. Okay, let's just say there's a million dollars, one million dollar job out there, a million dollars a year, one job out there. Okay, who's going to get it? Okay, say there's 20 guys, 20 men and women, 20 people out there. Who's going to get it? Well, is it the person that has two or three um, arrests on their record, that didn't get into the right school, that, I mean, this is assuming you're not lucky. I mean, let's just say you're not. Just, but every, every time, in order to get those types of jobs, you have to run the traps, right? Do this and you do this and do this. As you're trying to go up the career curve in our country, what are you using most in your body? Using your knee? No? Your liver? Kidney? Your brain. School and you were trying to train their brains to achieve their maximum potential. That's what we're really, they don't get it, right? They just think I gotta do homework, right? So we're trying to help them achieve their maximum potential. So if you're born with a Lamborghini engine, but you kind of pour a whole bunch of uh, water doused gas or put a bunch of sand in the, in the oil system, you know, you're taking it down to a, you're an old Toyota, you know, 20 year old Toyota Corolla or something like that. You know, you're, you've taken a really great uh, potential and you've heard it. And so what's it going to cost you as you lower your, your horsepower? What's it going to cost you when you, you're, you're using marijuana, takes away your motivation? If you don't really want to do your homework, you don't really mind not doing your homework. So you get a C rather than an A. What's that going to do? Oh, I'm okay. I'm going to be happy. So you, you get now. You, so you're now going to get another C. What happens if you get one legal charge? What's that going to do to your potential to get that million dollars? What if you don't get into a college that you really think could have made a big difference in you and you really maximize your potential? What if you actually don't hit the home run? as a junior or a senior in high school when the scouts are sitting there looking for scholarship candidates for their university because you actually used a couple of joints over the weekend, right? And it messed up your cerebellum and your hand-eye motor coordination. And instead of hitting a home run, you might have, you hit pop fly, okay? So what happens if you get, if you get a really bad sexually transmitted disease or if you get pregnant or if you get somebody else pregnant? because you were intoxicated, you didn't use the right protection, or didn't, you had sex in the first place, you never really want to have sex. So all these things, these are the, these are the consequences that the kids don't think about. Hey, I, here's a joint. Okay, this is cool. This is gonna, this is gonna be fun. Here's a beer. I just want, to, I want them to think about the consequences, and sometimes you talking about it in the right context at the dinner table can make a big difference. So, this is this line. You can't see the bottom. These are years. This is uh, 1960, and this is 2011. The red line is the potency of THC, which is the primary hallucinogen in marijuana. Okay, over the years, and basically every 10 years, it increased by 100 percent. Right? Why is this important? The higher the THC content, the more neurotoxic the substance is. Right? So back, you know, I'll, I'll have uh, moms that say, you know, hey, my daughter, you know, Dr. Rush, my daughter was asking me the other day, Mom, you smoke marijuana in high school or in college? Said, yeah, I did. He said, well, if you smoked it, I can smoke it. Well, that argument doesn't hold any water because the marijuana is totally different now 
than 20 or 30 years ago. All right, let me give you an example that you could probably relate to. You ever hear of 3-2 beer? You know, near beer? You know, it's kind of got to drink a lot of it to kind of get drunk, right? What if you were drinking 3-2 beer, trying to get drunk, and instead of 3-2 beer, you were really drinking Everclear? Think about that. You were drinking enough liquid to, to think you were drunk, but instead of really dilute, it was really potent. That's what happens in today's marijuana. The more marijuana, especially if it's legal, down here, the marijuana is about 1 to 3 percent potent. That, the grass, the weed that was back then. Now it's 30 percent potent. Okay? At InterHealth, most of the people we seek go outpatient. But we have this inpatient program, like I said. And so it's not very large, about 40, 40 patients, kind of more of a boutique thing. But now 20 percent of our admissions every year is primary marijuana. So there's this myth that marijuana is not addicting. Well, I can tell you, there's a lot of addicting problems of marijuana. And half of the people, because it's so potent, half the people that are admitted are psychotic. That means they're hearing voices, they're paranoid, and most of the time that goes away. Sometimes it doesn't. So luckily, most of the time it does go away. So that, that's the problem with marijuana, and this is what's dangerous. Now, the other thing that's out there, you know, another, the other substance in marijuana is CBD. You may have heard of that in the news. That's really coming now. CBD, theoretically, it doesn't have a lot of hallucinogenic properties. And so, and the potency of CBD for a long time now, now it's starting to go up a little bit, but it really didn't ever change. Right? So a lot, when you hear of medical marijuana, I'm going to cover that, by the way. Most of medical marijuana, a lot of medical marijuana is looking at the CBD piece of it. So we'll, we'll talk about that here in a second. So, you have a really potent toxic substance, and now the, the, the cartels and the, and the companies are making are giving you different ways to get in your body. You have a pipe, you have a bomb, you have a bubbler, you have a dab. Okay, you guys know what a dab is? A dab is a, you take a lot of marijuana oil and you congeal it like in a waxy substance. So it's, a, it's already 30% potent, but now you double or triple the potency, and then you, you just heat, heat that, it vaporizes, and it's really strong. Your standard joint, and then a joint that's more like a cigar-sized joint that's really potent. I take care of quite a few of the Dallas Cowboys, and you know some of them get they get they get caught, and so they get in the NFL substance abuse program. And when they relapse, they don't just smoke a joint; they smoke these huge, really big, giant blunts. So one use will last in their system for three and a half, four weeks. They go, so now they keep getting positive drug screens, even though they haven't used in over a month. So there's a and, and now so you have all these different substances, but you have this very highly potent um, uh, 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 substance that's quite toxic. And the other problem with marijuana, or the THC, is it loves your fat. It loves fat cells. It's called lipophilic. So it latches, unlike alcohol, you drink alcohol, it's out of your system in about 10 or 12 hours, depending on how many, or sooner, depending on how long you've been drinking, you know, how much you drank that night. Marijuana, you smoke one joint, it lasts in your body for seven days. Okay, so there's this myth you can smoke a joint on a, you know, after a football game on a Friday night, it won't bother your test on Wednesday. Not true. That joint, that marijuana is gonna get in your, your fat cells, it's gonna leach out slowly over the weekend, interfering in your studying for the test, decreasing your motivation to study. Going into the test, you'll interfere with your recall the information, plus looking at using your abstract ability to handle a complex problem. So it's gonna hit you at three or four different levels. And then if you smoked on Saturday night, you're gonna have even more. Okay, so there's this myth that goes out. But it, 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 and so what do you have? You have the THC, you have the CBD, and, you, and these are just two, two of about 250 different substances in the marijuana. Sometimes it's formaldehyde. Sometimes it's from, from uh, uh, fentanyl. Sometimes, sometimes it's just other, it's what the, the marijuana was cured with, the pesticides they used, the chemicals they used to dry it. So there's just a variety of different substances in there, right, that our teams don't know. So let's look at what happens to the brain when you're using the THC. Well, first of all, I mentioned this already once, is that marijuana stays in your brain a long time. It's, it's now, we now know it's potent. One joint will stay up to seven days. If you use two to four times a month and stop, okay, it'll take you about three weeks to get out of your body. Two to four times a week, take you over a month. Almost every day, take you almost two months. Uh, yeah, 
yeah, almost two months. And if you're using daily, it can take up over three months. Daily usually takes about six weeks to get out of your system, right? And that's a problem because if you're using daily and you stop, in about three weeks after you take six weeks to get out, three weeks after you stop, that's when the that's when the withdrawal is going to hit. We'll talk about that in a second. So the withdrawal doesn't hit right away. The withdrawal from marijuana, when you when you do have it, will happen about two or three weeks later when you least expect it. And then this is the this is different parts of the normal brain: hypothalamus, it controls appetite, hormone levels, neocortex. This is where you think and remember. Also, hippocampus in the middle. This is where you have memory. Um, and learning, sequencing, brain, brain sense, spinal cord, important for uh, vomiting, reflex, pain, cerebellum for motor control. So these are your normal areas. They all have fat. So when marijuana hits, it goes into your lungs, distributed through your bloodstream, and goes in all these areas, and kind of screws around with all these areas for quite a long time, gumming up the work, so to speak. So this is stats from 2014. Unfortunately, it's more, but these are ones that I just had. Um, basically, 78% of the 2.4 million people who began using last year, so 80% of the 2.4 million pe people used, were new for the first time, 80% was between 12 and 20. All right? Why is that? People use marijuana now for two reasons. Could you tell me why do they use marijuana? Besides their peers. Safe, okay? Safe because why? It's two things. It's natural and it's legal. That's why the kids think it's safe. That's why adults think it's safe. Okay, let's look at those two things. The fact that it's natural, right? Anybody ever want to smoke poison ivy? Okay. Uh, arsenic's natural. Anybody want to take some arsenic or poison? No. Um, and then the reason it's legal has nothing to do with the government certifying it. The reason it was legal is it was approved originally in Colorado and Oregon on a very in an off election cycle, not even like in November. It was like in a, in a really off, like in June, and they had a very small number of people at the polls. The companies that wanted to get it licensed got it got enough people at the polls that they, they had the majority, and so it got approved. Once it's approved, ah, oh, it's legal. Must be safe, right? So it has nothing to do with safety. Have you ever asked, have you ever heard of anything with the government, anything to, that the government does relating to be stupid? <laughs> right. Well, this is one of the stupid things. And then once, once you get it, and, and the reason, it wasn't the government, but it was just our democratic process. The companies that, that are making the marijuana stand to make a lot of money. And now they're making a lot of money every time another state gets legalized. Everybody, anybody, anybody ever heard of an Anheuser-Busch franchise? Okay. That's like if you get a distribution area of a, of a state or of the country for Anheuser-Busch, it's sort of like a license to print money. I mean, you're making tens of hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Same thing with marijuana. If you have a marijuana distributorship and you can get a state legalized, it's tens and sometimes even hundreds of millions of dollars if you have multiple states. Okay, so you just, I was talking to one of our, our uh, sales reps with Interhealth, Krista over here, and she just went home to Oregon over Christmas. Oregon's, you know, that, that was one of the first two, no, it was very quickly after Washington State got approved marijuana, Oregon's maybe had approved maybe for f three or four years, maybe five years. So she goes back to, at Christmas time, and there's all these billboards advertising. Everywhere she looked, there was another pharmacy with a F-A-R-M, pharmacy, a, 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 a dispensary for marijuana. It's just it's everywhere because there's so much money to be made. Oh, and so so if you if you don't think if you if you don't think it's dangerous, you're going to have an increase in use. And so now you basically have about three thousand kids a day, probably more now these days, using marijuana for the first time. Did a study, um, 2015. We have a, we have a, uh, they've done over ten years. They did a ten year study over a thousand people. They measured teens in their brains and IQs. The ones that the ones Teens that use marijuana regularly decreased their IQ over 10 years by eight points. Absolute huge number. Okay, so sort of in, in your vernacular, marijuana makes you stupid. We have hard data uh, showing you. And that's this is this is not this is not about missing tests or this is actually changing how smart you are. 
How smart you are really is how your brain works, right? How, your, how efficiently your brain works. It's changing that. So how do you know? What are the signs of marijuana use? Well, if you look at the following, it could be warning signs of substance abuse in your kids, not just for marijuana. Red eyes, flushed cheeks or face. A messy lack of care for your appearance. Unusually clumsy lack of coordination and balance. You say, all right, Dr. Herschel, my son's that. My daughter's this. Um, uh, inability to focus on tasks or handles. You know, any, any one or two of these is your typical adolescent. But if you have four or five, pay attention. And let me tell you, guys, most of us guys are clueless. Women, if you think, if you have a gut feeling that there's something going on with your kid in terms of substance use, there probably is. And if you think you're going to go ask, hey, 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 John, are you, are you using drugs? What are they going to say? They're going to, they're going to get really mad. They're going to get totally, and they're using, if they're, especially if they're using, if they're using, they're going to try and scare you away from that very topic by anger and in, they're discuss the whole independence thing and privacy stuff. So if you get a very out of character reaction for a very innocent question, pay attention to it. All right? And if you think there's a problem, take them to an expert. Don't you negotiate, I mean, don't you have to decide? Because as parents, we don't want our kid to have a drug or alcohol problem. We are scared to death. We are totally unobjective about this. So we want to listen and we want to believe their stories. Okay, look, I'm not saying there's a conspiracy out there, but I'm just saying, pay attention. This is a life and death thing. This is, it's you, you're, you're one of the life preservers for your child's brain. Okay? I mean, can you imagine, I have, a, I have a 11th grader here in Dallas. Can you imagine that poor guy? I mean, we've been, he's been peeing in a cup for a long time. Okay? I'm certain, but he, he still rolls his eyes, but he has the perfect out. Okay? We talk about Talk about it up times. You know, if there's a um, like, you know, we the, uh, the gentleman, the Porsche gentleman, that died of the e-cigarette when that exploded recently. Talked about it at the dinner table. You know, when a Dallas cowboy gets arrested for drunk driving, or or you know, one of the Kardashians has something to do with marijuana or drugs, or something, you just talk about it. You know, that those those are the ways. Rather than say, hey, what's going on with you in school? And you go, oh, nothing, Dad. But, you know, if, if it's something more celebrity-based or social media-based, now you start having conversations. And if you just start listening and stop talking, they'll start talking about things. All right? So that's, that's important. So pay attention to the signs. Okay? This is another thing that I like to talk about to the kids. All right? You know, by the way, I talk about this to the kids about their, about their friends. They don't really care about you. They love you. But they don't, on the surface, they don't really care about you. Right? Your friends, man, they are God. They are, you know, they're pure gold, right? And so you can talk about this, these types of things about their friends, and then they start putting two and two together. And that, because they can really get passionate, they can become passionate about some of their friends. But the other thing is, what in the world do you take? You know, if you're not using alcohol, if you're using some sort of drugs, weed or pills or heroin, what? What you're buying from the drug dealer, do you really know what it is? I mean, is the drug dealer some upstanding community citizen? Right. Do the, does the drug dealer even know where they got it? No. And I also like to say, what if we just took away the word drug? Let's say I, I had some, let's say I had some really good cheese. I mean, some delicious, absolutely delicious cheese. And I got this cheese and I brought it over. And I cut it up into pieces and put little baggies and stuck it in my pocket for five or six days and pulled it out and said, hey, would you like to buy some cheese? There's a little bit of mold. Nobody in their right mind would do that. Okay. That, that's a lot better than what's, what some of these substances, what's happening, you're treated with the, the weed and the, what, what it's been through and who spit on it and what they poured on it and who puked on it. They don't know. All right. So how do you know what they're selling is really weed? Um, if it's weed, how strong is it? What dose are you using? What's it mixed with? They put formaldehyde with weed. Okay, that's formaldehyde is what they embalm bodies with. When you smoke marijuana with formaldehyde in it, it embalms your brain cells. It is, can sometimes give you instant, permanent schizophrenia where you never would have had it before. 
Very, very scary. All right, what's growing on it? You know, what kind of bacteria in our stuff's growing on it? All right, you just, you just don't know. Mer medical marijuana. This is the other piece of fake news that the companies that make it, this is, this is a master marketing strategy is what it is. Okay? I want to try and dispel it. First of all, marijuana cannot pres be legally prescribed in any state. So there's some states where medical marijuana is approved. The doctors in those states, we as doctors get our, our, our permission or our authority to write a prescription from the DEA. The DEA is federal. All right? So even if, if Oklahoma, where they just passed marijuana, unfortunately, if, if Oklahoma says it's legal, if I'm an Oklahoma doctor, which I actually have a license in Oklahoma, we treat a lot of patients from Oklahoma and Dental Health, so if I, wrote a, if I wrote a prescription for marijuana, I could get thrown in jail by the DEA because federally I'm not allowed. Marijuana is Schedule 1. So no matter what the state says, so if, you're, if, if, I'm, a marijuana, if I'm a doctor in, marijuana, in Oklahoma and a patient comes to me for marijuana, I don't write him a script. I write him a piece of my letterhead that said, John, John, I recommend John has marijuana, signed Dr. Urschel, and then he takes that to the, to the dispensary. Oh, there's an MD, there's a signature, I'm going to give you a marijuana card. Once you have your marijuana card, you can get as much as you want. No other checks or balances at the end. In some of these states where it's approved, you have these billboards, call 1-800-WEED or 1-800-WHATEVER, 1-800-HIGH, and you can get a marijuana card mailed to you in the, in the, um, in the mail. Right? So, there's, so the, 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 the medical part is a farce. Right? If you're trying to use the substances in weed, marijuana, for medical reasons, there's primarily two of them. THC, we've talked about it, CBD. Different ones of these. So the THC works with nausea. THC works with appetite. CBD works with your seizures. I'm pretty sure THC works with glaucoma, and CBD works with pain. So these are the five main medical reasons that you use marijuana for, okay? THC comes in a pill form that's been approved for about eight years ago. It's paid for by your insurance company. It doesn't give you a high, and you know the exact dose, and a doctor can prescribe it completely legally. It's not Schedule One. So if you want, if you want to, instead of using marijuana, which gives you a high, you can just prescribe this medicine called Marinol. I can give you four milligrams a day. You take it, it handles your nausea, or your, helps you increase your appetite, or it helps, helps your glaucoma, whatever you're using it for, totally legally. No, no illegal pro, I mean, no, you know, no, no negative ramifications in terms of being marijuana. And CBD is about to be approved by the FDA as well. There's CBD oil out there you can buy on the internet. You don't know what you don't want to get a percentage of you don't, you don't really know how much is in there. You don't really even know if it's CBD. There's nobody overseeing that area. Because it's not an FDA approved subject uh, 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 medicine. The, these two have marijuana has also been said, hey, it really helps with sleep anxiety and PTSD. Hard scientific data, it makes all those worse. Okay? So you have these soldiers that go down to Austin, like in Texas. They're saying, hey, I, I have PTSD, I'm using marijuana, I'm perfect, okay? Well, if you have PTSD, the other thing that, you know another thing that makes you feel really good? Alcohol. You know, another thing that makes, you know another thing that makes you feel really good? Opiates. Well, nobody, if you have PTSD, you know you're not supposed to drink any alcohol. It's going to make it worse. Marijuana does the same thing. People just don't know that yet, All right? But that's what, the, that's what the research studies have showed. We talked about... The, 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 the Marinol, the CBD is almost approved, and, and finally the FDA will never ever approve marijuana. The FDA will never, because it's a, when you take marijuana, it's a solid, you light it, you heat it up, and you turn it into a gas. And when you change a compound from different states, from a solid to a gas, it changes its, the, way, the way it's absorbed, you change the dose, and so the FDA is all about dose and absorption. So you change the whole characteristics of the substance so the FDA would never, will never approve it, no matter how long they keep trying. So now they may, they may change the dose, but they, they're not going to approve it as a medicine. They may take it off the schedule, but they're not going to approve it as a medicine just because you never know the dose. Okay. Remember, if you have questions, just let me know as we keep going, all right? So trends. Well, 
Washington State Airport, this was a picture somebody took and, and sent me, has convenient shuttles to legal pot. This is called the cannabis, cannabis, okay? You walk out of the airport, every 20 minutes, a free shuttle to legal pot. Right? You think that it might be pretty enticing, pretty easy to get to? Emergency rooms. Okay, in, in Colorado, the emergency room rates for people overdosing on marijuana is doubling. Okay, fatal car crashes with marijuana in the blood has gone up 450% since they approved marijuana in the state five years ago. Okay, complicated slide, not really want you to get into it, but what I like to show this slide is this research was done right here in Dallas. It's a great institution called the Center for Brain Health. Dr. Francesca Philby does some really great research on adolescent brains with marijuana. And what this shows at the end of the day is as your brain grows, remember the myelin's forming and, and you get more neurons, more power, more, more you know, computer power in your brain as you get older. As the, new brain, as the new brain cells are laid down, the old ones are supposed to be pruned off. It's kind of like if a tree is growing, you want to prune the trees in the winter so more, more room for more branches and more energy. So you want to take the, the old neurons away so you can put in these really high-speed neurons as it keeps growing. When you smoke marijuana, it stops the pruning process. So you have the old neurons there getting in the way and cluttering, and the, the new neurons don't have enough room to grow or the speed to grow or the direction to grow. So she showed it in hard data, so she compared kids over three or four years who were smoking weed versus not smoking weed and looking at their brains. And published it in a, in a very, in, uh, 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 published in Developmental Cognitive Neuroscience in February of 2016. Right? Marijuana is a gateway drug. There's three gate, you know what a gateway drug means? You, you use the drug, if you start using it, it leads to harder drugs. Okay, now marijuana is starting to look pretty much like a harder drug right now, but let's just assume it's not compared to cocaine or meth or heroin. But um, it, the, three, the three gateway drugs are alcohol, marijuana, and nicotine. Okay? So those will get you going, and those will make you more susceptible to using other and getting addicted to other drugs. A lot of people say, oh, marijuana is not a gateway drug. Journal Americans... Mer Journal of the American Medical Association, the Psychiatry Section, 2016. Hard core research data showing, without question, marijuana is a gateway drug. When you're smoking marijuana, okay, the smoke from marijuana, when you're smoking the actual weed, right, is four times more carcinogenic than smoke from a regular cigarette. And it deposits four times as much tar. Don't really hear about that too much. Heart attack and stroke. Marijuana increases your heart rate by about tw between 20 and 100%. So let's just say your resting heart beats 90. I know that's high. Let's just say it's 90. Okay, you've been drinking a lot of Red Bull okay, as a teenager. right? And you, you, you double that 100% increase. That's 180 beats per minute. At 180 beats per minute, you can't get enough oxygen to your coronary arteries. So it's beating too fast. So you have a five-fold, five 500% five increase the risk of heart attack in the first hour after smoking. And that doesn't change, it happens this way. So a lot of people die of heart attacks from marijuana. Nobody's ever put the two and two together until they started looking for it. Smoking pot may more than double the risk of stroke. It may trigger strokes in young adults. It can also weaken the immune system. Weaken the immune system. What's one of the reasons you use medical marijuana? Cancer. Cancer, you know, to help increase your, help increase, to help with pain and cancer and to help uh, increase your appetite, right? So cancer is a, is a disorder of the immune system. So you already have an impaired immune system. You're trying to fix it. If you're using marijuana, it's going to mess your immune system up more for, further. People don't really think it through. Finally, this works really well in talking to your teenage daughters about marijuana. I'm dead serious. They may not listen to anything else. We know marijuana gives you the munchies. If you're trying to lose weight, marijuana is the last thing you want to be using. I'm, I'm dead, dead. That really works, by the way. When I, when I talk to students, I can see the teenage girls start fidgeting. They go, oh, I didn't think about that part. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Mental health. When you smoke marijuana because it's so much more potent, you have a 40% greater risk of psychosis. So that means, that means hearing voices and paranoia. All right? It worsens your anxiety. It worsens PTSD, just like I talked about with the vets. 
Okay? It also impacts your social connection. A lot of times, once a kid, your child would start using marijuana, they start changing peer groups. Okay? Or they start withdrawing because it makes them a little bit more paranoid. Or they don't feel the motivation to go out and be with their friends because they're just happy smoking. All right? And then there's a link between smoking cannabis and the earlier the smart smoking, the higher risk of schizophrenia, which is an extremely bad disease to have. It impairs your, this is a summary of a bunch of literature, okay, I'm not going to go through it just because of time. It impairs your short-term memory, the complex tasks which you need as you get older, ACT tests, SAT tests, uh, AP tests, complex tasks, difficulty learning that lasts for days or weeks after getting high, which then leads to these problems. Uh, this, is, this, is a, um, this is an area that really works with the teenage guys. Okay? The weight works with the teenage girls, the teenage guys. You really kind of sit up and listen. It changes your sex drive. Okay? It also it increases your risky sexual behavior, meaning you might not use protection or, or uh, be more, more, or more inclined to maybe get a situation where you might get somebody pregnant. It messes, it decreases your sperm count. All right? And motility because it alters your testosterone. If you use enough, to, if you use marijuana regularly, it should start changing your testosterone. As a teenage boy, the testosterone grows your testicles. Okay, so if you decrease your testosterone, it basically shrinks your testicles. Now, when you start talking about shrinking anything down here, <laughs> I'm serious. They, 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 they they'll laugh, but they're going, okay. I'm, I haven't thought about that one. If we can find there's now there's no data on this. There's no data that will shrink your penis. Yet. Yeah, I haven't found that. But when we talk about shrinking your testicles and messing with your, with your, with your uh, fertility, um, that, that can be something they'll pay attention. All we want to do is get their attention. We want them to think through some things. Remember, that's what we're not trying to tell them what to do. Withdrawal. Remember, if you use it daily and you stop, you're going to get withdrawal. These are the symptoms. Irritability, craving, anxiety. Nothing of this is life-threatening. Okay? But it's very uncomfortable, and it'll start about three weeks after you stopped. Most people associate withdrawal with something within a day or two of when you stop. So if you stop marijuana and nothing happens, oh, I'm not addicted, I didn't get withdrawal. You stay off it three weeks later, you start getting with symptoms. Oh gosh, I feel so uncomfortable. I know, I can go ahead and have some joint because I'm not addicted, and that'll make me feel better. So that's why a lot of people have to come in inpatient. These daily users of marijuana, you have to come in inner health and say inpatient for six weeks, and that's when they really start to clear. And then they notice it. We'll have kids that stand there for, for six weeks, and they'll say, Dr. Urschel, um, I feel so much clearer than I did when I came in. And they say, you know the scary thing was? When I came in, I thought it was just fine. But looking back, I was so messed up. They use a different word than messed. But I was so messed up, but I had no idea. If you do get addicted, we have some really good medications. We have no specific medicines that are FDA approved for marijuana, but your usual, your problems with marijuana have to do with anxiety and sleep. And so we can use medications that are already approved for other things to help you decrease your cravings, get you sleep and lower your anxiety. And it gets you feeling better, it makes you not want it anymore, it makes you be able to get past that six week mark and you can start to rebuild your life as long as we give you some other tools, et cetera, and treatment. The edibles. Edibles, so that means you, know, you can smoke it or you can eat it. The problem with edibles is that you, it takes a long time. So when you smoke it, it takes maybe 10, 15 minutes max to feel it. Sometimes a really quick, sometimes it's almost immediate, depending on how you use it. But the edibles, it takes about three hours. Okay, so like if you buy a cookie, Let's say you go to Colorado and you buy a cookie in one of the dispensaries, marijuana cookie. Mm -hmm. You look on the back, the packaging says, serving size of the cookie is one-sixth of a cookie. <laughs> Anybody ever eaten one-sixth of a cookie? <laughs> so let's just say, though, the teenagers, they said, okay, we're going to go have a, we're gonna go have a dose of marijuana. Okay, I'm not going to say that, but a dose of marijuana. If you had six teenagers, you take a cookie, you take a pizza cutter, you cut it up, and everybody has a sixth. All right? Ten minutes later... You know, they don't like to wait. Ten minutes is a long time. They're on their phones, right, right? Anybody feel anything? No. Wait a few more minutes. Okay, do a few more face, uh, 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 FaceTime or whatever they're going to do. So nothing. Man, that must be a weak cookie. Let's get another one. So take another cookie. Divide it by six. Take another dose. 
OK? Now they're at 45 minutes. Still nothing. Man, this is the cookie. This is, okay, we're going to take, just take a half a cookie. So that's three doses. All right? You keep doing it, scenario. Three hours later, they've probably had three to four or five cookies each. So that's, per each cookie is six doses. They might have had between 20 and 30 doses. And all of a sudden, the first one hits. As they sequentially hit now, they're going to get psychotic and they end up in the ICU. Happens all the time. These little gummy bears. Anybody ever, anybody ever bought a normal, not marijuana gummies, but just normal gummies, right? Do you, can you eat just one of those? No, the two of the pack, even if it's not a big, it will just kind of vaporize. I mean, you just eat them so fast. So if you eat, they taste like a gummy bear, right? And so you can eat so many of them and it, you don't feel anything, and then all of a sudden it hits. And that can be, you, you truly, in Colorado, and where, where it's legal, where it's legal, and you can buy them over the internet now, when they start eating it, they, they don't realize how long it's going to take, and they eat, they drink weight, I mean, they eat way too much. Then lastly, then we're going to move on to nicotine, the synthetic cannabinoids. So that's like K2 and spice. Okay, these aren't even marijuana, okay? These are synthetic chemicals that are, they're made in the jungles in Southeast Asia, like Cambodia and Laos, and in China. And these Chinese chemists come over and they make them because it's very profitable. They make it like in batches, like liquid, and then they take potpourri, like you buy for your you know, bathroom, and they spray the liquid and potpourri so it looks like a plant. And then they put in these little silver packets and they send it over to the United States. You buy it over the internet or you buy it in different, you used to be able to buy it at head shops or you know, bake shops, you can't do it by that anymore. But the problem is, you don't know what's in it. You don't know what that chemical was. Because they keep trying to change it so they can get around the, the Congress keeps making a certain chemical illegal. And then the chemist will change an OH group or an NA, or change a part of that molecule. And then technically, it's no longer illegal for a while until Congress says, all right, th this one's illegal. And so the, the problem is, <clears throat> it's not marijuana. But because it's synthetic, you multiply all the risks of marijuana I just talked about by a factor of 10, because it's so potent, it's not natural, it's potent, and you get, you get high, high risk of using these substances. Side effects are intoxication, withdrawal, psychosis, coma, suicide attempts, even death, really hurts your kidneys. And the doctors can't find it, it doesn't show up on a drug test. Doctors can't tell what you've had. Very, very dangerous. In fact, uh, when I was at uh, the Holland Park schools where, where Jennifer uh, saw me, I had a, one of our inner health uh, patients who's nice enough. He's been sober now for about four years. And uh, he was really into K2 because he got tired of his marijuana showing positive, so he switched to K2. And then he got psychotic and it took him a long time to get better, but he's better now. But he just talks about how dangerous it is and how they're he, he's really good at talking to the kids about it. Okay, tobacco. I'm going to go through a lot of this until I get to the vapes, and then we'll, we'll slow down a little bit. Normal tobacco, you, know, you can get nicotine. Nicotine itself, you have to do cigarettes, vapes, or e-cigarettes, it's the same thing, all right? Dip, or secondhand smoke, That's, those are the main, or you can get like a nicotine patch or a nicotine gum, right? But usually you don't, you usually use those to get off nicotine. You're usually getting nicotine through some of these, okay? And then the risk of nicotine over time these are, these are the, and you've heard a lot of these, uh, lung damage, heart damage, clots, damage to bones, aging your skin, damages your brain, narrowing arteries, gum, just so, there's a variety of things we've all kind of heard about. Nicotine itself, okay, changes your brain. Nicotine, this is a brain that's not exposed to nicotine, this is normal, and this activity in, in the control part of your brain called the limbic system, all right, that's what it's supposed to look like, this is a brain on nicotine. It changes the brain's functionality. The e-cigarette itself has different components. There's a battery, the lithium-ion battery. That's the one that, that's the part that blew up last week or whenever the gentleman died. All right, they've had other deaths from the explosive batteries, by the way. There's a part of it called the atomization chamber where the heating element it heats the liquid. You put a liquid in the top, or you put a liquid in a part. The element, the heat element, vaporizes the liquid, and then you inhale it. Right. So it uses a small metal element to heat the liquid in the e-cigarette. It's, it's called e-liquid or e-juice to create an aerosol or vapor. Right? The primary function is to deliver nicotine. That's the whole primary, is to deliver nicotine. Or now they're also putting marijuana, they're also putting THC. You get marijuana, you put cocaine, they put other drugs in there as well. 
Okay? Because the companies that are making them, with all the fake news, give you a give you an impression that it's safer than regular cigarettes, which is not true. We'll talk about that. Nicotine itself, any, however you get it in, right, affects the brain responsible for decision-making and logical thinking. It affects those, brain, it, those areas of the brain. It affects the brain respo areas responsible for aggression and emotional control, so you get more moody. Right? It also affects the part of your brain that focuses on control, controlling your attention and learning. With adolescents, nicotine, the adolescents using nicotine have a much harder time focusing and impairs their memory, even with secondhand smoke. All right, so that's a lot of, that's just nicotine itself. That's what it's doing to their brain and their brain function. There was a study done, this is looking at safety, there's a study done looking at the cancer-causing chemicals in cigarettes, regular cigarettes. And do you see those chemicals in e-cigarettes? Okay, and so this, this group, in California, you took 100 teens and back, you know, last spring, basically, and they, they took 67 teens who did e-cigarettes, 16 teens who did both e-cigarettes and regular cigarettes, and 20 teens who didn't vape or smoke at all. And then they looked at their urine, they looked at salivary testing, you know, looking at, at, at chemical compounds in both, your urine and your and stuff, and they found that the, the, they found, they were looking for the to look for the breakdown products of toxic chemicals that have been associated with cancer. Looking for the chemicals that might cause cancer they know were from cigarettes. They found that these, ch that these chemicals in both the smokers and the vapors, and they didn't find any of the chemicals in any the people who didn't do either one. Okay, so basically that's telling us e-cigarettes are giving you the same cancer-causing chemicals as regular cigarettes. I'll talk about that in a little bit more in a minute. So many toxic chemicals in liquid, which we have no idea what they are, there's no oversight of the, of the e-liquid, okay? We don't know the nicotine dose, we don't know what the other, there's no government agency or government body that's coming off the internet, it's coming from companies in and outside the United States, so we don't know what it is. My, my son, about three years ago, was trying to argue with me, saying, look, it's okay, we know what the nicotine dose is. I said, how do you know what's on the label? So what? You, you get a printer, you can, you know, Labels would mean nothing these days, right? All right. And then even if you knew what was in them, what happens when you turn them into a gas? You're changing many times the whole molecular chemical structure of that molecule when you change it into a gas. We don't know what that does now. Mouth sores. People that vape tend to get mouth sores. Just like you know, when you get a cold sore in your mouth that really hurts, they get those when they vape. The problem is when they vape, they, if you keep vaping, they don't go away. There's something in the chemicals in the vape that short circuit one of our healing cells called fibroblasts. If you listen, remember way back to biology, fibroblasts are the things that help create scars and make your scar tissue to allow cuts to heal. So if you have, if you're not vaping and you have a mouth sore, over time, after a week or so, fibroblasts work, take, cover it over, it doesn't hurt anymore. All right? So, but with vaping, something, there's short circuiting the fibroblasts. And so what they've also found is people that vaped, that died for some reason, I'm not saying from the vape, they just, they vaped and they died and they did an autopsy, just a random autopsy. They found that the people that, that, that vaped had these mouth sores went all the way down their trachea and into their lungs and all, or all over their lungs. We don't know, what, we don't hear about that. Okay, the, the, the companies that make the e-cigarettes are not talking about that very much at all, actually. So we know that it interferes with the body immune system. If it does that, what's it maybe doing to cancer? Cancer is a, is a dysregulation of your immune system. The scientific evidence is not, research is not caught up with the risk. Let me give you an example. How long does it take to cause cancer? How long do you have to smoke to get lung cancer about? I don't think you really know. What do you think? 20, 30 years, 40 years, right? Maybe 50 years. How long have e-cigarettes been out? Started in 2013. Okay, it's four years, five years, okay. So can you really say that e-cigarettes don't cause cancer when it's gonna take 20, 30, 40 years to find out? No. And if you have the same cancer-causing chemicals in the e-cigarette as you have in real cigarettes, well, chances are, and you might even be getting them at higher doses because you can change the dose of the liquid you're using. Oh, also, as I said earlier, you can add other things besides nicotine to these chambers. Okay, so you may think they're vaping, they may be using THC oil, methamphetamine, cocaine, other substances. All right, 
So what happens is you can change the dose of nicotine. That's what gets you more addicted. With a regular cigarette, you can't change the dose of nicotine. When the cigarette companies change, the, when the cigarette companies back way back when changed the dose of nicotine and make them more addicting, that's when they got and they got caught. That's when they lost the billions and billions of dollars. Those were the fines because they changed it. It makes it more addicting. Well, in e-cigarettes, we already know you can change the device by getting a different, um, a different uh, uh, strength of the nicotine e-juice. All right. So once you get addicted to a higher dose of nicotine, you get very uncomfortable. And so this, uh, what happens to a lot of kids is dad, mom and dad said you can't use. School says you can't use. You use it surreptitiously. You get addicted. You, you have a really high dose. You don't know what to do. So if you switch to regular cigarettes now, you've now decreased the dose. You can at least be able to think a little bit more clearly and not get so hyper. You can start sleeping a little bit better. So they started on something to stay away from cigarettes that led them to cigarettes. It's happening over and over and over. The lung toxicities from the chemicals in the liquid, we're finding that. Toxic nanoparticles, when that, that the e-cigarettes are, are, are made very cheaply, you know, it only costs 30 or 40 bucks to buy one. The heating element's made from very cheap metal. It's not made very well. When it heats to a high temperature, it starts breaking apart and throws all these toxic nanoparticles, goes into the air, goes into our kids' lungs. We don't know what that does, all right? E-cigarettes cause nicotine addiction, which we, I showed you that two or three slides of what the nicotine does itself, unrelated to the, all the other dangers of the e-cigarettes, just to our kids' brains. Causes a high risk of depression, anxiety, impulse control disorders. And if you use nicotine being a gateway drug, it makes it easier to get addicted to cocaine or meth if you did try it. Okay. The batteries can explode. We already talked about that. We already talked about we don't know what's really in the liquids. The e-liquids the e themselves can cause medical problems. These have been documented. Seizures, vomiting, brain injury from lack of oxygen, death. The kids, they think that e-cigarettes are safe. They take off the cover of the heat element and they drip the liquid from the bottle right onto the heat element and then breathe in those fumes. Completely unfiltered. It's called dripping. It can be very toxic. Kids pass out have heart issues, arrhythmias, et cetera, it can be very dangerous. And we already talked about it. only have four or five years of data on something that may be very detrimental in about 30 to 40 years. All right, how do you get started vaping? You get suckered in by the flavors, okay? Most kids start with just the flavor because it's not nicotine, it's kind of cool, it's a little device, it's hiding from your parents, and the flavors are quite uh, uh, enjoyable, apparently. But the flavors themselves, they had a study published real recently, the flavors themselves, no nicotine, change the chemicals and the flavors, change the cells in your heart and your blood vessels, making it more likely to have heart or stroke problems at a young age. Just the flavors. So the flavors themselves are not very good for you. Adolescents who use e-cigarettes are twice as likely to suffer breathing problems, including cough, persistent cough, bronchitis, congestion, and phlegm. Right? How do you know somebody's using it? How can you tell? Well, there's some signs right here. In the e-cigarette liquid is propylene glycol, okay, which also in itself causes cancer, but it makes you very thirsty. So if you're doing a lot of vaping you're getting, and your, your child is drinking a whole lot, a lot more, something to think about. It also, remember, it changes your immune system, messes with your blood, causes a lot more nosebleeds. Of all the, you know, but you know, this time of year, the air is real dry, you're going to have nose, so I'm just not, Child has a nosebleed once, don't worry about it. But if it's happening two or three times a week, something to think about. And then also, if they used to drink caffeine, but now when they drink caffeine, they really go off the deep end, they become more sensitive to caffeine, another sign that e-cigarettes may be in the picture. Again, like uh, Jennifer was showing us, these are some, these are some of the, the different uh, e-cigarettes, what they look like. All right, Juul. Juul is the big, is the 800 pound gorilla in the space of e-cigarettes. They have 80% of the market, all right? It's, it's a major vaping device manufacturer. And they, how you start on it, you start with the flavor, and then you add a nicotine, you add a cartridge that has nicotine, it gives you a head rush. Oh, I love this, this feels really good. But then after only a short while, you get tolerant to that dose of nicotine. You don't get the head rush anymore, all right? And now, the Juul comes in, you know, it has the highest amount of nicotine in, in its little pods. It has, it's the highest, it's the highest dose of nicotine you can get, right? 
It's more than double than the other vaping products. One pot is 59 milligrams of nicotine, which is equal to an entire pack of cigarettes. All right, that's 200, I think it's 200 uh, puffs in that pod. Kids are going through three to four pods a day. Okay, so we're talking about, remember what the nicotine's doing in the teenage brain I showed you, all right? And finally, in starting in 2013, finally in, in last, last fall, federal re regulators declared youth vaping an epidemic and in November caused Juul to halt sales of its mango, fruit, cream, and cucumber flavored pods. So the, it was gonna be stopped in, as of, it was, they were gonna be illegal as of um, January 1st. So late December, kids were going and buying four or $500 in, in, into the vape stores of, the, of all the pods. I want all the, you know, I want all the mango you have, et cetera, because it, they, they enjoyed them so much, all right? Juul also agreed to delete its Facebook and Instagram accounts, plus halt promotional posts on Twitter for using social media. That's how our kids get their information, right? And this is just disgusting. In December of 2018, Juul gave each employee, every employee that worked at Juul got a $1.3 million Christmas bonus. Every employee that worked at Juul got a $1.3 million bonus for Christmas. We're in the wrong business, right? But think how many teenagers, how many pods they had to sell. With all this negative stuff I'm just talking about, talk about mass destruction. All right, again, just some other pictures. You know, they, you know they, these things close. They look like a little key fob, like she was saying. It looks like a pen, a little like lipstick, etc. cetera. You, you, know, you can charge them on your computer. All right, <clears throat> we talked about the risk of starting on vapes and going to regular cigarettes to get relief from the intense nicotine addiction and also the risk of adding THC and marijuana into them. So let's, let's summarize here. A lot of fake news in the public domain, very little science. Nicotine itself is a neurochemical which is detrimental to optimal brain functioning, especially in teenagers, all right? It's, very, it's actually very dangerous from many perspectives based on strong scientific data. Every fact, every item or bullet point I've talked to you has a scientific study to back it up tonight. Understand that if you try these cigarettes with just the flavors, this is a message to talk to your kids about. If you try it for just the flavors, likely you're gonna go in and get nicotine. It's hard not to, just the culture and, and all the information coming in through social media. Because of the high level of nicotine in e-cigarettes, many smokers end up switching, going back to cigarettes. Nicotine use by teens and young adults decreases the brain's optimal learning ability and worsens mood swings. <clears throat> and I'm gonna talk about this in the next slide. If you do get addicted, we can treat it very effectively. The problem is the kids get trapped. They can't talk about it in school when they get into trouble. They can't talk about it with you guys. So if you start talking about it at home, say, I don't want, I don't want you vaping. Strong consequences for it, but if you get in trouble with it, I want you to come to me, we'll figure it out. Okay, that, that's important because they feel trapped otherwise and then they're going to go to cigarettes or other things. All right, so how do you treat it? Well, this is, you can treat addiction, nicotine addiction like you treat any other addiction. And basically, you're treating the whole brain. This is the part you think with. This is the part that gets addicted. This is the part that gets injured. So all the tools you use to treat addiction, whether it be alcohol or marijuana or heroin, you do an individual group and family therapy, you do some AA or some SMART, you do wellness, nutrition, all this stuff, that's all in the cortex that makes you think, all right? The problem is, this is the part that says, hey, Hal, Dr. Rochelle, you don't want to use it anymore. If you use any more alcohol, you're going to lose your wife. You're going to lose your kids. You're going to have your, you've already had your third DWI. You're going to get fired from your job. You're going to lose your liver. Any one of those would be a very good reason for me not to use, all right? But that's all my cortex. That, this is the intelligent part of my brain. The problem is, when the switch is flipped, the switch is flipped right here, oh, the switch is flipped right here in this area. It's like I took, if this were a computer, this is your hard drive, this is your Intel chip, addiction jams a screwdriver right through your, your Intel chip. It doesn't go down, but it starts short-circuiting. Every time, once you're addicted, every time this short-circuits, you have a craving. And the craving is how, with all those problems I, I, could, I would have if I use alcohol again, if I did that, it would make no sense. But when this activates, a lot of times it's so powerful, it overwhelms logic. It overwhelms my willpower, and I use anyway. And once I put the substance in, it, it reactivates the whole disease. Okay, so th these, all these 
talking treatments work in the cortex. You got to have medications to treat this because this doesn't listen to any logic. This has to do with medical complex chemistry changes. You need medications that are not addicting to help stop that. So the combination of those things. So we do that with, with we do that with um, uh, with nicotine. So with, with nicotine, what we do we, we do this totally telehealth. You don't ever have to come in the doctor's office. We'll have a psychiatrist talk to you, see if you have a, where's your depression, where's your anxiety, okay? We'll stop, if you stop nicotine, the first challenge to, to not starting again is the withdrawal. We have great treatments for that. You can use the gum, the patch, a medication called Shantix, bad, bad rep in the press, bad rap in the press. It's really a great medicine, it makes it very easy to stop, takes away the nicotine cravings, okay? We use some combination depending on the person. The next challenge to stopping smoking is depression or anxiety. We can use non-addicting medications and exercise, neurobiofeedback to help you with that. And third is the weight gain. That is, a lot of times we'll, we'll gain weight when you stop nicotine because nicotine is an anti-appetite suppressant. But if you know that ahead of time, focus on diet and exercise, most people never gain the weight. So you approach it comprehensively. You're usually, you're usually nicotine free or sub, you know, that's substance free within five to seven days. And then you, within 12 weeks, you're kind of past the whole problem. So we can do it very, very effective. That same type of approach you can use for any drug. Okay, this is what the National Institute of Health, the NIH says. This is what we use at InterHealth. The science is the key to, to the 85, 90% success rate. You basically can get detoxed. Got to treat the psychiatric illnesses if they are there. Medical, blood pressure, pulse, dental. Anti-addiction medicines, we have some medicines, like if you're an alcoholic, I can give you a shot now that will make you not want alcohol for 30 days. And if you try and drink, you don't feel it, you don't get sick. Here, you, just don't, you can't get drunk for 30 days at a time. Pay for by every insurance company out there. Okay. It's not a cure. It makes it a lot easier not to drink, though. When you don't want it, and you can't feel it if you do drink. Okay, so it's, these are two have the same thing for opiates. There's a lot of great medications out there that are not addicting. You can take for a year, year and a half, let your brain heal, and you don't need them anymore in many cases. Individual group therapy, family therapy, AA. The AA has a, has, a, has a role here. It's a good program, but it's not a treatment by itself to treat the illness. Stress management, wellness, nutrition, exercise, sleep management. All these pieces, both inpatient at the residential level of care in some cases, and some people never even go inpatient. Most people just stay outpatient. You get assessed. And do the assessment, and remember, if you have, if you have addiction, it took you 15, 20 years to get there. It's probably going to take eight or nine months over time of treatment. You, it's not going to happen quickly. You can't send them away to a residential program and then they're fixed and they come back and they're back. No, it's like if you have a heart attack, you got to change your whole way of life. If you work with your doctor, you can manage it. The diabetes, you have to change your way of life. If you have addiction, you have to change your way of life, but you can do it. Use the science. Hopefully, your kids will never get addicted. Your kids may run into problems. You don't know what's going on. We're happy to help. Even if you don't want us to help, you can call our 800 number. We're happy to refer you here in Cop Health. Some good therapists, some good physicians to help you figure that out. Okay, so the idea is talk about it. I know I threw a lot at you. Um, this whole, these two, so I gave you two webinar, two lectures in one. Give you a lecture on nicotine. I gave you a lecture on marijuana. On our website, if you go to innerhealth.com, I'll come back to that slide in a sec. Go to innerhealth.com. You can go and you can get the webinar where you can see all the PowerPoints. If there are parents that, want, that you know that might want to see this, or, or family members, or people that live in another country or state, they can go online. They can look at it. They can get these facts because we need to get these facts out in the world. All right. Closing summary of the two lectures sort of combined, a teen's brain is significantly injured even with infrequent marijuana use. Alcohol and drug addiction, unfortunately, if you get it, is a chronic medical disease. It can cause significant brain injury, but it can heal if you just stop poisoning it. Marijuana is addicting and potentially life-threatening when used frequently. Vaping is not safe and may be worse than smoking regular cigarettes. Marijuana addiction is very treatable. It takes about four to 18 months. Of if you stop poisoning the brain, your brain can reboot anywhere four to 18 months, depending on how old you are and how long you've been using. 
These are a couple other good websites. All right, and if you go to any of our webinars, all right, you can get any of these websites there. Drug free, th these are put on by drugfree.org. These role play. These give you specific ways to talk to your kids about alcohol and drugs. Healthy ways. Ways that will engage them and not turn them off. Okay? To go to these two, these are the NIH websites, National Institute of Drug Abuse, NIDA, National Institute of Alcoholism, we call it NI triple, NI then three A's, alcoholism. That's where you find all the scientific articles. You want to get them, they're kind of hard to navigate. A lot of them are kind of already culled for you and kind of presented to you on our, our innerhealth.com website. Lastly, Jennifer mentioned I wrote a book. Not here to sell you the book. If you go to our website, you can download a free copy of the first chapter of the book, which has most of the concepts of what I talked about in, um, uh, in this lecture already. It doesn't cost you a dime. And why I wrote the book is I wrote the book for the parents, specifically the moms. If you have a loved one with addiction, you don't know what to do. You go to your doctor, they, I guarantee you they will not know what to do. They'll probably refer you to AA. But if you, if you go and you can get this book, I mean, if you get the web, if you get the first chapter, they'll lay out for you what you need to do. No matter what treatment program you go to, they'll give you the, the scientific guidelines of what, how to get great treatment to get your, your loved one better, or your friend better, or your, your, um, your child better. Okay? So, great resource. If you want it, it won't cost you anything. Um, and I think that's...